Hi everyone, my name is Sneha and I welcome you all back to the second part of the lecture on deep learning and convolutional neural networks. So in the previous lecture, we focused on the MNIST dataset and we had a brief overview about the neural networks. Now we'll be focusing on deep learning basics and learn more about convolutional neural networks. We'll be focusing on creating a basic deep learning neural network and how to train the model and finally evaluate it. We'll also be exploring the opportunities to further improve our final model. So now let's focus on creating the layers. So um, first we'll have to import a few libraries that is you might, might know from the previous lecture. They are TensorFlow and Keras library. So from TensorFlow and Keras, we'll be importing models and layers to create the initial layers of our model. In this model, we have added two basic layers. So we are creating a simple dense layer neural network, which is also known as a fully connected neural network. So the first layer will take in as an input a 1D array of 28 cross 28 entries and then output a 1D array of 512 entries. You can uh, correlate with what I have said from this output of the summary output of the model that we are creating right now through these codes. So the activation function of adding the first layer is uh, ReLU. Finally, uh, for adding the second uh, neural network, we it will take in 512 entries from the output of the previous layer and output a 1D array of 10 entries. The activation function of this layer is softmax. So in this case, the index of entry with the highest probability will be the predicted label of a neural network model. One thing you might notice here is the no total number of parameters that are required to train our machine learning model, which is one of the basic deep learning neural network. And these are 407,050, which, which is quite a large number. So yeah, moving on to the next step is the network compilation. First, we have created our layers of our neural network. Now, we'll be compiling the network by defining the loss function, optimizer, and the uh, tracking matrix. So, optimizer is basically the mechanism that the network uses to update the network weight based on the input data and loss function. Loss function enables the network to measure its performance on the training data. And the metrics, which is accuracy here, is used to evaluate the model during the training and the testing. So given above is the code of how to compile our neural network. First, we'll be defining our optimizer, which here is root mean square propagation, or you can say RMS pro. Second, we'll be defining the loss function, which here we have used is categorical cross entropy. Cross entropy or class function in Keras is used for multi-class classification problem. And finally, our matrix, which is accuracy. The next step is of data pre-processing. We'll be reshaping our data points to fit them in our neural network. So we process by uh, the data by first reshaping the training images and test images. We might notice that we transform the 2D matrix used to represent the image to 1D matrix. The number of images in both the data sets remains the same. This step is to transform the input shape into the one uh, into the one the neural network expected. Another thing that needs to be done is to convert the value in the matrix from int 8 that is ranges from 0 to 2 to T5 to floor 32, which ranges from 0 to 1. Now, focusing on the categorical encoding of the labels, it is very important to encode our labels while creating and while analyzing our machine learning models. So this is one of the naive approaches of encoding our labels. The result contains 10 new variables, or you can say columns, where each column contains uh, one image if 
if the image belongs to the category represented by the column or a zero otherwise. So these are the codes required to, cover, uh, to encode our labels. Finally, let's have a basic overview of what we are doing and why are we doing it. So this slide basically tries to give you guys a high level overview of the dimensions. The dimensions of the original image is 28 horizontally and 28 vertically. That is, it is a 28 cross 28 pixel image, which is flattened into an array of 784 elements, which becomes the input into a dense layer with 512 neurons that feeds into an output layer, which is also a dense layer with 10 neurons. So uh, the final part is the training of our network. We, the following is the procedure to how a model is, how a machine learning model is trained. So this is basically a, a Python code train a model. F the first step is to compute the neural network output based on the training data. The second step computes the loss based on the loss function, which is a measurement of mismatch between the prediction. I'm so sorry. Yeah, so the second step is to compute the loss based on the loss function, which is a measurement of mismatch between the prediction and the actual result. The final step is to update the network weights using the optimizer. These three steps are repeated iteratively until we get the model with the highest accuracy. And this iteration also depends on the number of epochs that we define. So here we have defined five epochs. That means this, uh, the number of iteration this model will go through will be five. So now let's look at the training set uh, accuracy and the uh, results of this particular code. So following are the tra uh, results of the train of training our model. After running it through five epochs, the batch size, however, is 128. For batch size, we means that we are considering 128 images at a time before updating the weights. So as you can see in the first epoch, our model accuracy for the training data set is 87.4. For the second epoch, it's 96.67%. For the third epoch, it's 97.8%. For fourth, it's 98.61%. And finally, after the fifth epoch, after the fifth iteration, we obtain a very high accuracy of 99%, which is a good accuracy in terms of machine learning models. But one might suspect a problem of overfitting here. But uh, to detect that, we'll first see the test data set results. To calculate the accuracy for our test data sets, we will run the following code. As you can mention, as you can see from the output of this particular code, we are seeing that there is an accuracy of 97.85%, almost 97.9%, which is different and worse from our accuracy of a training data set. So this indicates overfitting. What now you might ask what overfitting is? Overfitting in terms of machine learning is a model that corresponds too closely to the training data sets. So in general, overfitting can be reduced by using cross-validation and monitoring the assessment metric on a validation or testing data set while training. We should stop training when the assessment metrics become worse. So as we have seen earlier that uh, there were some gaps in the test uh, train set accuracy and test set accuracy. Do you guys think that there are any ways to improve? There are. We can use convolutional neural networks to avoid overfit. So the rest of this lecture will focus on convolutional neural networks. So like I mentioned before, convolutional neural networks can be considered a better way for image processing and computer vision machine learning models. We'll apply a convolutional neural network to our MNIST data set in this part. 
and we'll see the result and if it improves our accuracy and the problem of overfitting. So before uh, creating and applying the model to our MNISD data set, let's first focus what exactly a convolutional neural network is. So following is an il illustration of convolutional neural networks. In the next three, four slides, we'll be talking more in detail about the each part of this image and what exactly it depicts. So uh, first, let's talk about convolutional neural networks versus layered neural networks with dense layer. Convolutional neural networks takes a 3D tensor with the shape of image height, image width, and image channel as input. A color image has three channels, one for red, green, and blue, while a grayscale image has only one channel. So for convolutional neural networks, there is no need to flatten or reshape the tensor. Uh, one more thing I would like to mention based on our intuition about convolutional neural network is that you might notice that dense layers learn global patterns while convolutional neural networks learn from local patterns. So now talking about convolutional operation, they when using Keras to create a cognet, Layer, there are two key parameters that we need to consider, and these are size of the patches and the depth of the output feature map. Size of the patches are extracted from the input. In this case, it is three cross three, which is very commonly used, but there can be larger uh, size patches. And talking about depth of the output feature map, that the number of filters generated by the computation. We typically choose 32 or 64. Now, talking about the operational procedure, there are four steps to follow. These four steps basically articulate the four steps on the diagram on the slides on this slide. So now let's talk more about the operational procedure. First step includes the window height and the window width shape window will traverse every possible location on the input feature map. Several window height and window width input patches will be formed in the second step. And in the third step, each of the patches that are formed will are, are transformed into a vector of shape of output depth. By computing the dot product with the kernel, uh, that is the weight matrix or filter. Finally, these factors will be spatially assembled into a 3D output tensor of shape, that is height, width, and output depth. To have a more intuitive understanding of these <laughs> steps, we'll see more in detail about in the next slides. So now first uh, look at the implementation of uh, the CNN. The implementation of CNN is shown in the following Python code. It uh, So as we can observe that the first layer takes an input shape of 28, 28, 1 and the output shape becomes 26, 26, 32. This is because there are 26 cross 26 valid positions for a three cross three patch on a 28 cross 28 input feature map and 32 filters. There will be things that will affect the valid position such as border effects, padding and strike. So it, it's a little bit trickier when you take border effects into account. Padding may mitigate the border effects. So we'll talk about border effects and padding in the next slides. Talking about uh, border effects, so after a convolutional operation, the output feature shrinks a little. The patches is formed by moving the specific size patch around the image and stopping at every valid location. The image is shown in the valid location for a three cross three patches on a five cross five input is shown in the figure. So the... Uh, to avoid border effects or to avoid shrinking, we can use padding. 
It is basically an input feature map in effect getting smaller and smaller with the application of convolutional operation. So um, now let's talk about strides. Strides basically refers to the number of pixels moved between successive patches that is center tiles of all input patches do not need to be contiguous, but the default is one. Notice that one of these patches has one open pixel between them on the input feature map. However, strides are rarely used in convolutional neural networks. The next we'll talk about the max pooling operation. Max pooling operation is basically used to downsample feature maps by transforming local patches. Max pooling basically outputs the maximum of each patch. Generally, max pooling will use a two cross two patch with a stride of two. These two cross two patches will be transformed via hard coded max tensor operation instead of using a kernel as in step three. So as you can see from the model summary here, the output feature map is being halved from 26 to 13. Now, finally, we'll add the final layers to our uh, convolutional neural networks. Um, so we'll be adding dense layer to the networks after several convolutional operation. The model summary shows the structure of our convolutional neural networks. Notice the number of parameters that need to be trained. That is 93,322. So although this is a more complicated architecture, it is more suitable to image processing and the number of parameters are decreased significantly. We uh, finally will be um, importing our MNIST dataset to the convolutional neural network and will first pre-process it and compile our neural network and finally fit the training set. So after five epochs, we can see the first epoch, uh, if I'm, the, sorry, uh, we have the result for the third epoch. The third epoch gives us the result of 98.57 accuracy. And finally, after fifth epoch, we have an accuracy of 99.4%, which is kind of same the one we had earlier. But to cross check about the overfitting, we'll need to see the test set accuracy. The test set accuracy now using convolutional neural network is 99.2. That means there is an improvement of tech, uh, test accuracy of 97.9%. Or, or like as compared to uh, in the previous section. Although we could have made more improvements by changing the parameters, for example, the number of nodes, the number of layers, the number of parameters. But we have made a significant uh, progress in terms of accuracy, and this is a good model. So uh, let's summarize what we have learned in both of the lectures. We learned about convolutional neural networks. How are they efficient for image pre-processing and for computer vision machine learning models? So convolutional neural networks are powerful. They are default for image processing. There could be millions or hundreds of millions of neural networks weights, and there can be multiples, dense, uh, multiple hidden layers in a convolutional neural networks. There is no right number and there's no fixed or right number to have a certain, to include uh, for the layers to include in your model. However, it may take a very long time to train on large data sets. Finally, Thank you so much for your patience listening.